So, from last week, the Buddha's claim in the Brahmajala Sutta that his body stands outside the tree of being is at odds with just about everything ever written about early Buddhism. But this peculiar statement does not stand alone. It is closely related to the idea of a body endowed with sentience, what the Buddha elsewhere calls a kadava endowed with perception and mind. These charismatic utterances imply that mind is not a quasi-independent entity standing over and above the body, observing information provided through the sense faculties. What we call consciousness is, for early Buddhism, an emergent feature of a person's cognitive apparatus and not a Cartesian ghost in the machine. The Madhupindika Sutta articulates a philosophy of mind along these lines. A person's ordinary waking states of consciousness are shown to be gradually constructed, involving language and conceptualization of the higher levels, but initially belong, beginning with the arising of pre-noetic sentience in a sense organ and in relation to a sense object. A different philosophy is attributed to Sari Putta. He seems to consider mind a subject of con cognition in its own right. For Sariputta, the term vinyana corresponds to the feeling of being an observer. What in Western philosophy is usually denoted by the terms mind and consciousness. Hence Sariputta's vinyana can be directed towards objects to bring about transitive or repetitive consciousness. Calm insight soteriologies build upon this philosophy of mind. They state that mind is to be carefully controlled, subtly conditioned, and directed towards the desired liberating goal. These samatha vipassana soteriologies dominate the early Buddhist literature, but they are problematic because they assign no importance whatsoever to bodily mindfulness, a practice of outstanding importance in the early Buddhist text. If, in the end, mind has to be separated from bodily experience, mindfulness of body does not contribute anything towards liberation. But the implications of Kachana's philosophy are quite different. His emergent account of consciousness implies a sort of cognitive deconditioning, the reduction of waking consciousness to its somatic basis. Perhaps something along the lines of the Buddha's teaching that a particular attitude ought to be cultivated towards the source of cognition. <coughs> so we suspect from last week that there are two philosophies of mind and two corresponding philosophies of meditation in early Buddhism. Agreeing with Sariputta might seem to make sense. The entire Indian tradition follows his calm insight lead. On the other hand, Kachana allows more prominence to sense perception. Kachana's philosophy seems to make better sense of mindfulness, a key Buddhist practice. Before building on these observations, we must first question them. Are there really two distinct philosophies in the Pali Suttas? Our preliminary study is based on just a few texts. Perhaps a wider study would show that the ideas of Sariputta and the ideas of Kachana are not in conflict. Perhaps also insight meditation can be conceived differently as a way of utilizing bodily mindfulness. A more comprehensive study is required. We need to draw out the philosophical implications of Kachana's philosophy and the calm inside tradition. To do so, let us ask two simple questions. First of all, what does Kachana identify as the cognitive problem which must cease? To study this problem, will involve an analysis of two aspects of the Madhu Pindika Sutta. The notion of conceptual proliferation and the notions of latent tendencies towards view. Based on a study of these concepts, we can ask a second question. Is the cessation of Papancha and Ditti consistent with calm insight practice or not? Our analysis here will focus on two aspects of early Buddhist soteriology. We will first analyze the key ideas and terminology of calm insight texts. 
asking whether these practices can be understood as a non-conceptual solution to the problem of papancha and ditti. Are karma insights simply forms of constructed mental activity and therefore part of the problem, or do they transcend conceptual proliferation and view? Finally, we will consider whether the teachings on conceptual proliferation and view suggest other soteriological possibilities. According to Dhammapada, verse 254, human beings delight in papancha, mm -hmm. Tathagatas are devoid of it. Just as all Tathagatas of the past are without conceptual proliferation, so too is Gotama in the present age. As the householder Upali tells the giant leader Mahavira, I am a disciple of that blessed one who is tamed and devoid of papancha. The Buddha also claims that the lack of papancha and the path leading to it is part of his teaching. In Sangyutta 43, unsurprisingly, the goal of practice is occasionally said to involve the transcendence of papancha. For example, Sangyutta 35, where the Buddha gives the following advice. Therefore, bhikkhus, you ought to train as follows. We will abide with a, with a mind devoid of papancha. In the very same text, the Buddha claims that the person who thinks is bound to Mara, whereas the one who does not think is released from the evil one. We do not here have a precise formulation, but more information is offered in the Dasutara Sutta. <coughs> the Dasutara Sutta's account of the eight thoughts of a great man. These are that the Dhamma is for a person who has few desires is content, is secluded, has aroused vigour, has established mindfulness, has attained absorption, has gained insight, and delights in the lack of papancha. This is more or less a simple path for structure. All the qualities here seem to run in a hierarchical pattern. So this, the non-conceptual state without papancha seems to approximate the goal of the path and is preceded by an undefined calm inside practice. We don't know what the, uh, the terms six and, um, six and seven, samadhi and panya, we don't know what they are in this text. The Chula Sihanada Sutta is clearer. The Buddha here similarly states that the culmination of the path is for those who delight in the lack of papancha. But we also find out that this occurs after a person has understood the conditionality of views. Whichever ascetics or Brahmins, bhikkhus, understand as it really is, the arising, fading away, danger in and release from these two views, these two views are the views of being and non-being, they become devoid of passion, hatred, confusion, thirst and grasping. They gain vision and are without favouring or opposing. They delight in the lack of conceptual proliferation and are released from birth, old age, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, depression and tribulation. They are released from suffering, I say. Insight is here said to be an essential prerequisite for liberation, rather than an immediate or, pro or proximate cause of it. We understand that liberation the state without papancha only occurs for those who have some correct understanding of view, a right understanding as a sort of verbalized knowledge. This is important, correct understanding of the formation of view, the rise and fall of view. Or ideas, any ideas, sets the condition under which the cessation of papancha can occur. We will soon see the significance of this idea. Before considering this further, let us return to Kachana's understanding. In the Madhupindika Sutta, sorry, I'll keep it on this. In the Madhupindika Sutta, Kachana has a cyclical understanding of Papancha. He says that conceptual proliferation is generated by verbalization. But he then says it lies dormant, along with apperception and reckoning, 
And in this dormant state, it afflicts a person. So after its formula, formula, formulation through verbalization or reasoning, what is called vitaka, papancha then is said to exist as a deeply embedded mental structure. And this sets the conditions under which <coughs> further verbalization functions in the future. So we understand papancha has two dimensions. It is the innumerable ideas and concepts which result from language use. It is also the matrix which underlies a person's use of language. Another important text, the Sakapanya Sutta of the Diga Nikaya, focuses on Papancha not as an underlying matrix of thought, but as the phenomena of ideas, actual ideas. Such manifestations of thought might concern oneself. As is pointed out in Sangyutta 35.201, where the content of Papancha is defined as follows. I am bhikkhus, this is conceptual proliferation. I am this, I will be, I will not be, I will be embodied, I will not be embodied, I will be conscious, I will be unconscious, I will be neither conscious nor unconscious. This is conceptual proliferation. Conceptual proliferation, bhikkhus, is a disease, a boil, a dart. Therefore, bhikkhus, in this matter you must train yourselves. We will abide with a mind devoid of conceptual proliferation. While the focus is here on proliferation of thoughts about oneself, since Kachana's philosophy states that papancha results from six types of sense contact, it should also concern the multiplicity of ideas a person has about the world of external objects. And this seems to be stated in the Sabya Sutta of the Sutta Nipata. Discerning conceptual proliferation, name and form, internally and externally, as the root of ill, he is released from being bound to the root of all ill. That one is known to be thus, his nature is said to be thus. And I'm not entirely sure about the final pada. It's a bit ambiguous, but it means something like that. We, we are dealing with two terms, tata and tadi, which are indicating indefinability, as in the word tathagata. So the Buddha's state of being thus is opposed to conceptual proliferation. And conceptual proliferation concerns the ideas a person has about internal and external reality. So conceptual proliferation can refer to the mass, it refers to the mass of individual conceptualizations of which a person's mental world consists. In this context, it is significant that the Sanskrit term prapancha means quintuplication and refers to the manifoldness or diversity that exists in the natural world. So we conclude that the Buddhist concept of prapancha consists of a profusion of ideas about subjective and objective reality, which arises through apperception and language use, and which lays down deep ideational structures in the mind. Let us now turn our inquiry to a closely related concept, the Buddhist understanding of view or ditti. In, well, in last week's lecture, this is part of the Madhupindika Sutta. In the Madhupindika Sutta, the Buddha claims that when a person has the right attitude towards the roots of the, the basis of cognition, this brings about the cessation of the underlying tendencies towards view. This means that in the Madhupindika Sutta, ditti and papancha seem to be almost synonymous. They are at least overlapping terms. They can perhaps be broadly considered within the general category of the latent tendency towards ignorance. Mentioned in the Chula Vedala Sutta, along the latent tendencies, alongside the latent tendencies towards passion and aversion. So three Buddhist causes of suffering. Passion, aversion, ignorance. Ignorance 
is the latent tendency towards view. Just like the Madhupindika Sutta, the Chulavedala Sutta claims that all such tendencies arise in connection with sensations. So it seems that both Papancha and Ditti are more or less synonymous, terms referring to a person's mental world. The, a person's mental world which sets the conditioning, sets the underlying linguistic conditions which condition that world in turn. How far does this conditioning go? Can we say anything more about what it means to be afflicted by the latent tendency towards view? I think we all can because we're all suffering from it. But to answer this question, let us enlist the help of two ghosts from the Indian Buddhist past, Malunkiputta and Vachagata, two wandering ascetics obsessed with knowledge, but who later became Buddhist bhikkhus and then arahants. Both men vividly illustrate what it means to suffer the affliction of knowledge, the state of being dogged by the underlying tendency towards forming views, but then also finding liberation from it. The views that both Malunkiputta and Vachagata were obsessed with are the ten points on which the Buddha refused to comment. This well-known tenfold list of unexplained points. Is the world eternal or not? Is the world finite or not? Is the soul or the life principle the same as the body or not? Does the Tathagata exist after death or not? Does the Tathagata both exist and not exist after death? Or does he neither exist nor not exist after death? These are the questions that Malunkiputta and Vachagata were obsessed with. And it's easy to sympathise with them. These questions are perennial points of human curiosity. We will always ask them. Where do we come from? What ultimately happens to us? Why does the world exist? What is its purpose? All of us would probably like to have these questions answered. Malunkiputta and Vacha were luckier than us. They lived in the age of Gotama, a Buddha, the best of gods and men. Who better to give them the knowledge that they want? At last, finally, their troubling concerns might be resolved. It seems that Malunkiputta became a Buddhist bhikkhu rather late in life, precisely in order to have these questions answered. We can imagine him biding his time before eventually approaching the Buddha, solemnly but with fervent anticipation, to put his questions. At first, Malunkiputta is cautious and nervous, but he gradually gains in confidence as he proceeds to the final questions about the post-mortem state of a Tathagata. Suddenly, Malunkiputta stops and there is intense quiet. What will the Buddha say? The silence deepens. Anticipation, unfortunately, turns to puzzlement and then frustration as it dawns on Malunkiputta that nothing will be said. Malunkiputta is confused and despondent, but others perhaps realize that the Buddha's meaning lies in his silence. So what is the meaning of the Buddha's silence? This difficult question cannot be avoided if we are ever to understand early Buddha's thought and meditation. Let us begin with the Buddha's explanation to Malunkya. The Buddha in the Chula Malunkya Sutta offers a pragmatic reason for not saying anything. He says that seeking answers to the questions does not lead to the cessation of suffering. Attempting to do so is like a person shot by an arrow, trying to find out facts about the person who shot him, rather than simply being healed. It is therefore better to focus on the noble truths which the Buddha has declared, and which are spiritually efficacious. This pragmatic reason for not answering the questions has often been the focus of modern academic study. It is also favoured by Nagasena in response to King Melinda pointing out the Buddha didn't teach Malankiputta anything. Why, Melinda asks, can you say that the Buddha had no closed fist of a teacher? 
Melinda says, either the Buddha didn't know, or else he kept the matter secret. Nagasena argues that the Buddha set the questions aside because they, not, they could not be a cause of illuminating Malankiputta. And anyway, Buddhas do not utter words without a proper reason or cause. However, this pragmatic explanation is only given by the Buddha in a few more discourses. Less than a quarter of the suttas on the unanswered questions have this explanation. What else does the Buddha have to say? A number of suttas point, to the, point out that the questions occur only to the ignorant, not to the Tathagata or to a Buddhist bhikkhu who has been taught to think differently. This ignorance is repeatedly said to be due to a misunderstanding of the five aggregates. At Sangyutta 44.7, Mogalana explains that ascetics of other schools answer the questions because of their identification with the sense faculties. The, book of the Buddha, lacking this identification, leaves the questions unexplained. In the very next sutta, Sangyutta 44.8, Mogalana says that the ten questions are answered by those who see the five aggregates in terms of self. At Sangyutta 44.3, the four questions about the Tathagata are said to be bound up in the five aggregates, connected to them. But these questions do not apply to a Tathagata who is not in the domain of the five aggregates. So we can see that the questions arise and answers to them are proposed by those who are caught up in attachment to the aggregates. They are the concern and preoccupation of those whose reality is defined by the five aggregates, who think in terms of them. The Buddha cannot answer the questions because his reality is different. The reality of things seen from the perspective of the aggregate is different from the Buddha's reality. And it is the Buddha who see, sees things as they really are. For the Buddha, questions put from the perspective of the aggregates are based on wrong presuppositions. The Buddhist way of putting this is to say that the ten points are dependent on the five aggregates. A dependency transcended by the Buddha. And this is why he stays silent. A clear statement of the dependent origination of the Ten Views occurs in Sangyutta 24.9, where the Buddha asks, When what is, bhikkhus, dependent on what, and with what inclination does the view the world is eternal arise? The answer is the five aggregates. A similar analysis is found at Sangyutta 41.3 the subject of which is the ten questions and the sixty-two theses of the Brahmajala Sutta. <clears throat> Here, the householder Chitta asks, These views, Venerable Sir, come about when there is what, and do not come about when what is not. <laughs> Venerable Isidata from Avanti responds that they depend upon personality view, which is here defined as seeing the five aggregates in terms of self. What is the problem with this dependency of the views on the aggregates? Some texts imply that the basis provided by the five aggregates is limited. This point emerges in texts which focus on the fact that the aggregates are a process. For example, a series of suttas in the Abhyakata Sangyutta, Sangyutta 44 containing discussions between Sariputta and Kotita. One text, Sangyutta 44.5, makes a simple point, about, simple point that the questions about the Tathagata only occur to those who are attached to the aggregates, but not to those unattached. But in the next sort of Sar, Sariputta says the question only arises for those who delight in the five aggregates and do not understand them their arising cessation and the way, to the, this is the way to the cessation. Likewise, in the first sutra of this series, Sangyutta 44.4, 4, 
Sariputta simply states that the four questions are asked by those who do not understand the aggregates, their arising, cessation, and the way thereto. The same point is explored in the 55 suttas of the entire Vachagata Sangyutta, Sangyutta 33. Vachagata here asks the Buddha why the ten questions arise in the world. The Buddha replies that it is due to people not understanding the aggregates, their origination, cessation, and the way thereto. We understand this to mean that the basis of the views, that on which they depend, is not an immutable foundation for knowledge. If the aggregates can occur and cease, and can even be altered by following a specific program of spiritual cultivation, they are limited and limiting phenomena. Any view based on them must be circumscribed. Being dependent on the, the aggregates, the ten views thus define a particular version of reality. But this reality can be altered and a person set free from its limitations. The most striking statement of this idea occurs in the Agi Vachagata Sutta, where again Vachagata questions the Buddha about his failure to explain the ten points. When asked if he has any view, the Buddha simply says that view has been put away because of seeing the rise and fall of the aggregates. The Buddha thus claims that because he has seen the rise, fall and the way leading to the cessation of the aggregates, he is released, released from the, through the cessation of all thought, churnings, and every underlying tendency towards the thought, I and mine. This is very suggestive. A knowledge about view formation seems to precede the cessation of conceptualization, a transformation which is liberating. When the Buddha tells Vacha that he has annihilated the five aggregates, the message is clear. The Buddha claims to have fundamentally <coughs> altered the condition process defined by the five aggregates. Instead of having a view, the Buddha claims to have understood view formation and gone beyond it. At this point, we should say it is crucially important to note that the five aggregates denote not what a person is, but the way experience works. This means that the dependency of the ten questions on the aggregates is a dependency of ontology on epistemology. The views result from the way human beings' cognitive apparatus works. How cognition works, that is to say, the five aggregates, is in fact a summary account of cognitive conditioning, close to Kachana's philosophy. The only difference between the, the list of five aggregates and Kachana, apart from the fact that Kachana has extra terms and doesn't use the term Sankara for volitions, is that Vinyanam, I have put it here out of place, Vinyanam is the fifth of the five aggregates. This is not really a problem, I think. I have written elsewhere um, that this particular formulation with Vinyana coming out of place, it should be at the beginning, really. It's because of the particular context in which the Buddha thought of this list. The Buddha was having a discussion about Upanishadic ideas. Hence, the teaching must culminate in Vinyana. That's the key Upanishadic definition of the self. Anyway, all of the texts on Vinyana in the list of five aggregates match Kachana's definition of it. We're dealing with the same idea. So when we read Buddhist texts on the five aggregates, when we read their rise and fall and ideas, such ideas, we are talking about your experience. What, is the, what are the causes involved in you having this your normal human experience. That is what the aggregates explains. What this means is that the ten questions, they're dependent on 
how your mind, not just your mind, how we're, we're starting with the body, how your experience is built up from the bodily level, from the bodily reality. It, your experience is built up in a certain way. Then you ask questions such as the ten questions. It could be different. The early Buddhist analysis of the underlying tendency towards view thus goes further than the analysis of conceptual proliferation. View is much more than conceptual bias. It is the outcome of a, form, a, a more fundamental problem about the mechanics of experience. Cognition normally works in such a way as to lead to a world of conceptual proliferation of views. Views about self and world. But the workings of cognition can be altered and reality reset. So we have two important implications. To get out of view formation, a person must first understand the cognitive conditions under which it occurs. Following this, spiritual practice must bring about the cessation of these underlying cognitive conditions. Correct spiritual practice should thus consist of the deconstruction of conditioning. It should be neither conceptual nor volitional. If it is conceptual, it is merely a form of knowledge, and so remains within the limits of cognitive conditioning. Likewise, any spiritual practice imagined in volitional terms, and talking about the higher levels of spiritual practice, any spiritual, higher spiritual practice defined in terms of volition as the deliberate cognitive act must also remain within the domain of the aggregates. We understand that the Buddha's liberation, expressed through profound silence, was achieved not through will, not through ideas, and not through any sort of mental construction. It was, in fact, the result of the cessation of the very possibilities of such forms of cognition. Let us now see if these points are true of the calm insight soteriologies. I begin with meditative states, pure meditation, samatha. In the previous lecture we identified a problem with samatha tradition inner concentration could be criticized as a form of mental construction. So the practice of, of samatha, in the sense of holding the mind on an object, looks like a sort of conditioning, producing an artificial quietude occurring within the realm of ideation. In fact, exactly this type of critique is made by some early inside texts. The Atta Sutta uses the four jhanas and the first three formless meditations as the basis for the following insight. The bhikkhu abides having attained the first jhana. He reflects thus, the first meditation is mentally constructed and volitionally produced, but whatever is mentally constructed and volitionally produced is impermanent and subject to change. Thinking these thoughts leads to liberation, defined as the destruction of the corruptions. The same contemplation forms the content of liberating insight in the Chula Sunyata Sutta. Although it occurs after the bhikkhu has attained the highest meditative attainment, the signless concentration of mind, which seems to be equivalent to the cessation of perception and sensation. He understands thus the this signless concentration of the mind is mentally constructed and volitionally produced. But whatever is mentally constructed and volitionally produced is impermanent and subject to change. Knowing and seeing thus, his mind is released from the corruptions of sensual pleasure, being in ignorance. Insight, other insight texts, such as the Maha Malunkya and Jhana Suttas, approach this understanding not by focusing on the state itself as a mental construct, but the different factors in them, the different mental states within them, as impermanent, empty, and not self. But the same critique applies. The states produced by samatha 
are conditioned and hence not ultimately satisfactory. This problem seems to have been recognized and a meditative response formulated through the idea of non-volitionally produced states of absorption. The clearest example of this is in the Potapada Sutta, which describes the following contemplation occurring within the sphere of nothingness. From the point at which Potapada, the bhikkhu becomes conscious by his own means. From there to there, gradually, he touches the pinnacle of perception. While remaining at the pinnacle of perception, this occurs to him. It is worse that I, in, that I intend, and better that I do not intend. If I were to intend and construct, these states of perception would cease, and other grosser ones would arise. Why don't I stop, stop intending and constructing? He neither intends nor constructs, and in doing so, those states of perception cease, and other grosser ones do not arise. He touches cessation. <coughs> Famous passage from the Potapada Sutta. Mm. However, it is problematic. The problem of construction is rightly identified here, but the solution is dubious. Can one intend a state of non-intention? <clears throat> is the thinker able to stop thinking? Can anybody simply decide not to think and then it happens? The deciding not to think is a thought itself. You're trapped. Even if this would be possible, does non-thinking solve the problem of deeply embedded ideational structures? as we have seen in the analysis of the dependent origination of cognition. Or are such states of absorption or non-thought simply, temporary, sus simply to temp temporary suspension of conditioning, no different from being in a coma? And the early Buddhists had discussions like this. They said, you know, they had discussion where one of uh, Bhikkhu would say, what's the difference between a dead corpse and somebody who has attained cessation? And they found it very difficult to answer. Mm -hmm. Even if you have attained cessation, why should conditioning not just resume after emerging from it? Maybe the Potapada Sutta accepts this criticism, criticism anyway, since it does not claim that cessation is liberation. If we go back and look at this account in the Potapada Sutta, of course it, it is in the Sila Kandavaga, this is where all the accounts of the path, the model on the Samanya Palace to take place. But this, we get this, and the bhikkhu gets to the tip of uh, consciousness and then stops and attains cessation. But it doesn't say he's liberated. Yeah. He is just in a blank. We conclude by noting that the idea of cessation is a state of inner concentration in which the mind is abstracted from reality. I will not say anything more than this, having not experienced it. We are still, anyway, in the Cartesian theatre of mind, the only difference being that the light of awareness has gone out. It is doubtful, then, that states of Samatha-style concentration meet the challenge posed by Kachana's philosophy. They do not offer a coherent way of bringing about the cessation of Papancha and Ditti. They show no understanding of the very deep levels of view formation, and they say nothing about the cessation of cognitive conditioning. Instead, they just imply that Samatha concentration is a state in which thought is temporarily suspended. This critique of Samatha as conditioned and impermanent and not ultimately liberating goes back to the very beginnings of Buddhism. Something like it can be seen in the Bodhisattva's contemplation that the states of nothingness and neither perception nor non-perception do not lead to Nirvana. Hence the ultimate inadequacy of pure meditation has always been a feature of Buddhism and is keenly noted in the Theravada school. 
The same is not true of insight, the insight tradition, which in modern Theravada is often contrasted with Samatha as the original and truly effective feature of Buddhist soteriology. But it is not clear that it is any less susceptible to the same critique which it levels against Samatha, namely that of being a conditioned process. The insights described in the important insight texts and passages are clearly conceptualizations. At no place do these texts indicate they are using words as symbols to describe a trans-conceptual understanding. The Attika Nagara Sutta uses the verb patisanchikati in its account of insight. The same verb used, we saw last week, in the Diganaka Sutta's account of Sariputta's liberation. Well, Sariputta is standing behind the Buddha, fanning him, and Sariputta contemplates the Buddha's teaching that has just been given, and he is instantaneously liberated. It uses the same verb here as in the Atkanagara Sutta. Throughout the Pali Canon, this Sutta implies verbalization, and the verbalization is always given. There's no doubt about it. The account of insight in the Chula Sunyata Sutta is the same, but it uses the verb Pajanati, connected to the word Panya, insight. This doesn't make any difference. The two insight passages are identical. In other places, the Mahamalunkya and Jhana Suttas use the verb Samanupasati, commonly used in the Pali discourses to indicate a person's contemplation of important ideas, such as the not-self teaching. These two suttas, the Malunkya and Jhana suttas, also describe intentional activity, turning the mind away from certain phenomena and focusing on it on another idea. Even the paradigmatic account of insight contained in the Samanyapala sutta does not avoid this critique. It is difficult to see how the idea of turning the mind towards the knowledge of the, tr the, the noble truths can be anything but deliberate conceptualization. Indeed, the verb abhininameti, to turn, to turn towards, describes all the non-liberating insights in the Samanyapala Sutta. It is also used in the Kāyagata Sati Sutta, in the simile of a skilled charioteer. <coughs> So the, the Kāyagata Sati Sutta, the, the, the Sutta, the discourse on bodily mindfulness, it has a calm insight conclusion, and it uses the simile of the charioteer. So it says that the charioteer who takes the reins of a chariot in one hand, the goad in the other, can go wherever he wishes. And this activity is likened to the act of directing the mind to any object to be known through understanding once mindfulness of the body has been cultivated. So the verb, I haven't put the passage in, this is the verb that which, uh, the key verb in this passage is the same as in the Samanyapala Sutta. The main account of liberating insight in the Buddhist texts in the Pali Canon is insight into the <coughs> noble truths. This is the simile which describes that mental activity. It clearly indicates deliberate conceptual activity. Let us finally consider in detail the insight teaching of the Dhatu Vibhanga Sutta. This text is complicated but proposes a contemplation resulting in a pure state of equanimity. What then should the Buddha should the bhikkhu do with this equanimity? The text tells us. The bhikkhu understands thus. If I were to focus this equanimity, so pure and cleansed, on the sphere of the infinity of space, my <coughs> mind would conform to that, and this equanimity of mine would thus remain for a long time dependent on and supported by that. This is construction. <coughs> He neither constructs nor intentionally directs that equanimity towards being or non-being. 
neither constructing nor intentionally directing towards being or non-being, he does not grasp at anything in the world. Not grasping, he does not tremble. Mm -hmm. Not trembling, he is fully quenched within. This is another insight text on the constructive nature of meditative states, albeit one which does away with the requirement of actually experiencing them. The bhikkhu progresses from insight to non-construction and liberation without practicing higher meditation. So the insight is into the idea of the construction of mental states, and yet the only constructive activity occurring is the insight contemplation. The text displays no awareness of this absurdity at all. It seems to highlight the insight blind spot of the tradition. It's one thing for this type of contemplation to occur within a meditative state. You have something to observe as a construction. But if you've not done that, to criticize that as a construction sort of misses the point because your thought is the construction. Not that you haven't attained the thing you're criticizing. So the inside texts make rather grand claims. And some early Buddhists must have been aware of the problem. Otherwise, a text such as the Mahachanda Sutta probably would not depict meditators abusing bhikkhus devoted to the Dhamma as follows. But here, sir, meditating bhikkhus, jayi bhikkhus, abuse bhikkhus devoted to the Dhamma. But these bhikkhus, claiming we are devoted to the Dhamma, we are devoted to the Dhamma, are haughty, arrogant, fickle, chatty, with loose words, confused mindfulness, not practicing wakefulness, not attaining absorption, with roaming minds uncontrolled in their sense faculties. What are these devotees of the Dhamma? Why are these devotees of the Dhamma? How are these devotees of the Dhamma? One wonders how seriously to take this, but mm -hmm. I think quite seriously. It's not some Monty Python-esque charade. <laughs> this is an ad hominem attack, and not an attack on the philosophical problem with insight meditation. However, it at least suggests a keen awareness of the problem of being caught up in ideas and concepts. Hence, we conclude our analysis by noting that neither insight nor calm meditation offers a compelling solution to our questions posed earlier. Calm insight texts do not offer a philosophically persuasive answer to the cognitive problem of Papancha and and ditti, the underlying tendency towards view. Both calm and insight seem equally to be trapped in emergent states of consciousness dependent on the list of five aggregates. Kachana would not be impressed. While the conceptual critique I'm offering here utilizes some chronological analysis, this is not our primary aim. We are not denying that calm and insight have important roles to play. Understanding must precede any meaningful spiritual quest, and calm must be cultivated as the quest develops. We are only arguing that conceptual understanding and states of inner concentration cannot liberate at the higher decisive moments of the path. So how should we understand the higher moments of the path? Do the early Buddhist texts have any other conception of these higher spiritual realms apart from the calm inside teachings? The Indriya Bhavana Sutta is a vitally important text in this regard. The Buddha, in conversation with the young Brahmin Uttara, criticizes the teaching of the Brahmin Parasarya, who is said to teach the cultivation of the senses so that one does not see with the eye, one does not hear with the ear. So we see this is the question the Buddha asks this young Brahmin, assuming he is a, a disciple of this uh, Parasarya. How does Parasarya, the Brahmin, teach the cultivation of the senses to his disciples? The answer, 
One does not see a form of the eye, one does not hear a sound of the ear. And the Buddha concludes, this being the case, a blind man would have developed his senses, a deaf man would have developed his senses. This looks exactly like one of our arguments against the use of inner concentration at the higher stages of the path. But we have a different interpretation from Analayo. He claims the point made in MN152 is how to relate to everyday experience. In fact, the expression development of the faculties in Bhavana is an obvious counterpart to the restraint of the faculties, Indriya Sangbara. The exposition in MM152 is not a criticism of deeper stages of concentration, during which sensory experience is absent, but rather a criticism of attempting to deal with sensory impact during daily life by simply trying to avoid it, instead of developing equanimity towards whatever is experienced. I find this a peculiar reading of the text. The term bhavana is not synonymous with sangvara. Cultivation implies much more than restraint. Let us look at the Buddha's question. The Buddha's question, does the Brahmin, Parasarya, teach the cultivation of the sense faculties to his disciples? This is not a question about everyday experience or attempting to deal with sensory impact during daily life. The question is in fact tantamount to asking what does the Brahmin Parasarya say is ultimately to be done with the sense faculties on the spiritual path. This is exactly how Uttara understands it as his response shows. When the Buddha then goes on in the Sutta to explain the unsurpassed cultivation of the senses according to the discipline of the Noble One, he is clearly talking from a higher perspective. What is ultimately demanded of the sense faculties at a high level of spiritual practice? Indeed, the Buddha's teaching which follows the Buddha's teaching which follows is a call to advanced practice, culminating in the statement, "You bhikkhu should meditate, Ananda. Do not be negligent. Do not have regret later on." How does the Buddha say we should meditate in this text? He, the Buddha offers a spiritual practice which avoids inner concentration. So the teaching, the main teaching goes something like this. This is the unsurpassed cultivation of the senses according to the Buddha. Here, Ananda, having seen a form with the eye, pleasure or displeasure or neither arises in the bhikkhu. He understands thus. Arisen in me is pleasure or displeasure or neither, but that is constructed, gross, and dependently originated. This is calm, this is supreme, namely equanimity. That pleasure or displeasure or neither of his ceases, and equanimity remains. Easy. <laughs> the Buddha here directs attention to what could be called the mindful practice of staying with experience of understanding it and letting it fade into equanimity. At first sight, this practice looks quite like the inside meditation practices considered earlier. We see that awareness of the dependent origination of experience is a very important aspect. But this understanding is not the goal that liberates, nor is the state of equanimity which results directed then to any goal. Equanimity remains. What happens to it? Well, the Buddha then goes on to give other ways of dealing with sensory experience, but these teachings culminate in an, an important statement about how a bhikkhu should understand equanimity. The Buddha says, eschewing both that which is repulsive and that which is not, May I abide equanimously, mindful and fully aware. This is the final statement of the teaching, and it uses the language of the third jhana. Suggesting, indicating, 
that this is what happens when you practice equanimity like that. A similar teaching is offered in the Saka Panya Sutta of the Diga Nikaya, where the god Saka asks about the conduct leading to the cessation of conceptual proliferation, apperception and reckoning. It is useful for us that Saka uses Kachana's terminology. Anyway, in response to the Buddha outlines a practice based on three mental states. Depression, happiness, and equanimity. Each of these three states has two subtypes. That which leads to an increase in bad states of mind and is said is to be rejected, and that which leads to an increase in good states, which is to be welcomed. The teaching, the final teaching on equanimity is as follows. Therein, the state of equanimity one might know as follows. As I resort to this state of equanimity, bad states are abandoned and good states increase. This kind of equanimity ought to be practiced. Therein, there is a distinction between the equanimity with reasoning and reflection and the equanimity without reasoning and reflection. But those states of equanimity without reasoning and reflection are more exalted. In identifying a state of equanimity without reasoning and reflection, this teaching points towards the cultivation of a non-conceptual equanimity via the four jhanas. We therefore move closer towards the answers to the questions posed earlier. Kachana states that apperception and conceptualization form deeply ingrained layers of conditioning, which are a major aspect of suffering. This conditioning must cease. But apperception and conceptualization are part of the mundane human, co human cognition. Apperception and conceptualization arise with cognitive conditioning. How does one circumvent this? Calm and inside meditation cannot logically achieve this goal. As we have seen, they are described in such a way as to appear part of the problem rather than the solution. Another way is needed, and this is suggested by the Indriya Bhavana and Sakapanya Suttas. This way seems to involve a more natural practice of mindfulness, developing over time into absorption. Such teachings are close in meaning to the teachings of the Madhupindika Sutta. The Indriya Bhavana and Sakapanya Suttas thus provide a mindfulness-based soteriology, in line with Kachana's teaching on cognitive conditioning, and ultimately achieving the cessation of papancha and ditti. How this is to be achieved through sati and jhana will be the subject of the next two lectures. Thank you.